Uh, yes, so my name is Duncan Rand and I'm in the High Energy Physics Group at Imperial College. I'll talk about IPv6 rollout within uh, the WLCG. So uh, the contents of my talk, I'll talk a bit about the LHC, which you've probably heard of, uh, the WLCG, which is the grid, the computing grid that supports it, GridPP, which is a project that I work on uh, in, in the UK, some rationale for IPv6, our deployment plan, current status, um, and a bit, a bit more detail um, about some of the data transfer and network monitoring that we're doing. So the Large Hadron Collider, um, it's located at CERN near Geneva on the French-Swiss border. Um, it's a proton-proton and heavy ion collider and there's, there's four main experiments. There's two general purpose experiments, Atlas and CMS. Uh, Imperial College is on CMS. Queen Mary that you're going to hear from uh, next, Chris, is there on Atlas. Um, there's two specialist experiments, LHCB and ALICE, which is a heavy iron experiment. Imperial College is also on LHCB. So during run, run one, uh, we found uh, the Higgs particle in 2012. That was very well publicized. Um, and then the run two started in 2015 at a higher energy. And that just finished uh, this Monday, Monday of this week. And as I said, the computing for the LHC experiments is carried out uh, by the worldwide LHC computing grid. Uh, and that's known as the WLCG, or most often just the grid. So the WLCG is a, is a COBOL collaboration of more than 170 uh, computing centers spread across 42 countries. Uh, and the, its mission is to provide global computing resources to store, distribute, and analyze the 50 to 70 odd petabytes of data generated per year by the LHC experiments. The sites are arranged hierarchically, tier zero uh, at CERN, CERN now has another data center in, in, in Hungary. There are 14 tier ones which are based mainly in national laboratories around the world. They're represented here in, with green, green markers and, and the UK one is at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire. And then uh, the majority of blue indicators there you can see are the uh, smaller centers, the tier twos, which are generally located in university physics departments, such as Imperial and Queen Mary, indeed. GRIPPP is the UK's contribution to the WLCG. It's a collaboration of 19 institutes which provide data-intensive computing resources for UK particle physics. On the left, you can see the actual universities, and then on the right is a screenshot I took of a Google Earth map uh, showing the names that the, the, known, the universities are known by within the WLCG. Neither Imperial nor Queen Mary appear on that. So, so uh, initial modelling of the LHC, probably about 20 years ago, I suppose, um, indicated, or the LHC computing requirements indicated that a hierarchical tier-based management and transfer model would be required. And that's because it was felt that the network would be a limiting factor. The idea was that data would be ex exported from the tier one that you can see in the center there um, at CERN to each of the tier, tier one, sorry, the tier zero at CERN to each of the tier ones uh, in green. And then to the outer circle represents the tier twos. And, and the idea was that uh, data from RAL would, would, would serve the UK uh, tier twos. But it turned out when, when the LHC was switched on that the, the, we had better than net expected network bandwidth and it meant that we could relax this hierarchy. And so now data is generally transferred in what we might describe as an all-to-all -all mesh configuration. Uh, and it's often transferred long distances across multiple domains. So for example, CMS transfer to Imperial College in London uh, might well come from Fermilab, the Fermi National Laboratory, which is near Chicago in the US. And indeed, I think the majority or a large, very large portion of our data does come across the 
Atlantic. So what, what goes on in, in the WLCG site? Well, um, these sites generally consist of, apart from a lot of service, several service nodes, uh, basically of uh, a large compute cluster, several thousand cores, and a similarly large disk storage cluster, uh, roughly a, a few petabytes. And the, the ratio is pretty much a petabyte per thousand cores. Data is transferred in and out by some software called uh, the File Transfer Service, developed at CERN using the Grid FTP protocol. And then when some data there, computing jobs arrive um, at the site and uh, they either will either produce a lot of simulated data, about half the data is simulated, or they'll do some processing on, on the data that's stored locally. There's, there's also a, a, a mechanism whereby jobs can read data remotely from other sites. Um, and for example, to use our Queen Mary and Imperial connection, Queen Mary now reads the CMS data that it accesses from storage uh, that's at Imperial College. And it's envisaged that this remote reading of data is likely to increase uh, as we move forward in the future. So why are we interested in IPv6? Well, uh, the, general, the WLCG uh, has quite large computing demands and we generally don't uh, have quite enough. So we're open to the idea of new computing resources. And we're hoping that uh, there might be some opportunistic CPU resource offered to us. And these may well be IPv6 only, in which case we want to be able to make use of them. So the main goal now is to make sure uh, data at our sites um, is, is accessible by clients that run on IPv6 only machines. And of course, there are all the other reasons that are, that are well rehearsed in, in, this, in this meeting, uh, uh, such as running out of IPv4 addresses, and we'd like to use, avoid the use of, uh, of NAT. So our initial plan was to, um, within WLCG, was to, to make the experiment central services dual stack so that they could communicate, communicate with uh, IPv6 only node uh, machines, test out some, some worker nodes to make sure they actually would work, um, and also to deploy network monitoring so that we can keep track of, of uh, what's going on in IPv6. So, uh, and also the primarily to make the site storage accessible over IPv6. So here's, here's the timeline. Um, April last year, we wanted the tier ones to uh, start providing dual stack storage to, to get, get moving. Um, and uh, the Atlas and CMS, the experiments to provide central services on dual stack. Uh, and then April of this year, we'd like, we wanted dual stack storage at the tier ones to, to be moved into production. And then by the end of run two, which is about now, we would like to, we wanted a majority of the sites to have to migrated to, to being IPv6 compliant. And here's, um, I suppose, the WLCG version of the, the, of the Google chart that we see regularly. This is essentially the percentage of the hosts uh, which are dual stack. So starting off in 2014, there's obviously very few, and now we've reached this, the magic number, which I've heard already several times today, of about 25%. So that's a kind of very basic uh, measure of progress. As I said, we wanted to test out the ability to run on IPv6 only uh, compute resources, and uh, that was, that's being done at, uh, for CMS at Brunel University in London, which is part of the Group EP collaboration. And for Atlas, uh, at an, uh, the Joseph Stefan Institute in Slovenia. And that is actually running production jobs. So this is a plot I took from, from the Atlas monitoring and shows there's an average there of about 200 jobs running over the last week. So what happened uh, well, in terms of uh, dual stacking the storage? Uh, I'll move on to discussing that now. This, this shows what happens. Uh, in January 2018, when the, uh, the, the storage, and there's quite a lot of it at CERN, uh, it's called EOS, was, was made dual stack, so they turn on IPv6. And this is the IPv6 internet traffic, which you can see at the point it was turned on, went from very little to about five gigabits a second uh, 
into CERN and then about 10, roughly 10 gigabits a second out of CERN. But this is only a fraction of the total traffic. So um, a colleague uh, at CERN is also summing up the amount of or the traffic flow through CERN. Some of it goes between the tier ones and some of it's uh, LHC1 traffic as well. But the, the, uh, here, the point here is really just to try to show the progress or the changes that's being made uh, in terms of the volume or the ratio of IPv6 to total traffic. So this only goes back to January of this year when we started measuring this. But uh, you can see that it varies from month to month, but again, it's broadly around 20% uh, of the traffic is IPv6. So moving on to, to the rolling out of dual stack at the tier ones and the tier twos. Of the 14 tier ones, uh, nine of them have been done, been made to dual stack. Five still have to uh, implement it. For the tier twos, of which there's a, there's a, large, a larger number, um, we, we, we ticketed them, we decided to ticket them. Um, and that was done in autumn of 2017 to, to find out what their status was, what their plans were, and also to request that they start uh, both implementing dual stack storage or making their storage dual stack and also the PUF sonar hosts that uh, most of the sites already had. And then, uh, as usual, the ticket was used for, to follow up with assistance, checking, deployment, etc. So several of the sites uh, have waited and are still waiting for their campus network infrastructure to become IPv6 ready. And in only a few of the sites, uh, is the problem really associated very much locally um, in terms of making, making progress. So uh, GGUS ticket, GGUS is the ticketing system that we use in the WLCG. Um, 115 was submitted and this is the situation in February of this year. Uh, approximately a fifth well, had already been completed and then you can see that we've split, this, the tickets are split into in progress in which there's some likelihood of progress or some is active, actively working on it. On hold, meaning that there's some uh, problem that's not going to be in, immediately changed and then no reply. And on the bottom right, you can see the, uh, the breakdown by, by country group. And the UK here on the right has the largest, got the largest number of sites. Um, Broadly, it, the average there is, is obviously uh, a roughly a fifth. So how, how, is, how have we evolved? How's that evolved over, during this year? The, the, the previous pie chart was taken from roughly uh, at this point here. And then you can see that the number of the no replies dropped. And as, that, as it did, uh, the, the number of done sites has marched steadily up and to the right, which is nice in, uh, in plots such as these. The on hold and the progress, the number is roughly the same. So now we move to the current situation. This was uh, some data that we, we took at the beginning of this week or the middle of this week. And you can see that we've made some progress to so almost a half of the sites, the tier two sites, have dual stacked their storage and implemented uh, perf sonar. And the, the chart at the bottom right is pleasingly more green. And we've also included some of the US sites uh, on the right. And the, these sites in the US are, are, are very large. They're, they're small in number, but they're very large in terms of the disk storage. So what does that mean now uh, in terms of uh, the proportion of the storage which is accessible over IPv6, which is, of course, the whole point of this exercise? We can now look at the um, the, the, the proportions and overall it's about almost 50%, almost a half. And then I've given the, the breakdown, individual breakdown by, by the experiments. And we also record in the UK separately with Ingrid PP the proportion of the storage which is accessible over IPv6. Um, and that's now 50, just over 50%. A couple, yesterday it was 43%, um, but luckily, well, 
uh, uh, one of the sites at uh, the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory uh, turned on IPv6 yesterday, and they're quite a large site, so <laughs> it's, it's now 53%. Uh, it's now yesterday or, or the day before, I forget exactly when. Um, and so now that we've got a, a proportion of our storage that's accessible over IPv6, what does this, what's the effect had on the volume of data that's being transferred uh, or the proportion over IPv6? So this plot at the top shows the aggregate transfer rates over the whole of the WLCG. And uh, physicists like to report, or the WLCG, we generally use gigabytes per second rather than gigabits. And there's, I, I pointed that out because there's been some confusion about that in the past. Uh, so you can see that it's uh, roughly, uh, on average, about 20 gigabytes a second. Um, but it does vary. And this data goes back to, that I'm showing, goes back to about July 2017. The small blue arrow there is where we, um, where we sent out the tickets, requesting the tier twos to start thinking about or to, to, to make positive efforts to implement the IPv6. And then the, that's just, you can see the, the change in the orange uh, bars, which are the, the IPv6 uh, traffic. Sorry, so the green is IPv4 and orange is IPv6. And we're now roughly at about 20 to 25%. So there's been a, a slow but steady increase uh, in that volume, and we hope it's not going to go down. Another point I'd like to highlight is that um, for some reason, transfers over IPv6 appear to be more reliable. And so what I mean by reliable, this, the, the term there that is used on the plot is efficiency, but actually I, I would prefer to use the term reliability because that's the number of, of transfers that actually succeed and uh, usually they're repeated but so you can see that for some reason IPv6 transfers are more reliable. So moving now on to uh, network measurement with Perf Sonar. Uh, Perf Sonar is a network monitoring tool which is developed by a number of sites uh, in the, US, in the US and Xi'an. Uh, it's a widely deployed test and measurement infrastructure that's used by science networks and facilities around the world to, to monitor and ensure network performance. And so the, the WLCG has deployed Perf Sonar for, for several years now, and the idea being that we would like to, to, to be able to monitor our networking and to find and isolate problems and alerting in time, to characterize the network, um, such as to find the baseline performance before some changes are implemented. And in the future, there are some plans about uh, using it to provide a source of metrics for, for higher level services. Uh, and the important thing that Perfsonar is and has been for a while, uh, IP, IPv6 enabled. So uh, this allows us to, or the software allows you to create meshes, meshes of hosts which you test against each other. Um, as I said, each site was requested to deploy Perf Sonar, um, and then we've got meshes with a variety of groupings, such as the optical private network, uh, CMS, Atlas, and we can test together and try and ensure the network is, is good and functional for, for the transfers that we need to make. The UK also runs a mesh, which I maintain, um, and it's dual stack, uh, and we measure throughput, latency, loss, and the trace route between hosts. Uh, and this has turned out to be useful also in the work that I do with Tim. It gives an insight into network performance over IPv6 and IPv4 within the UK. And so this is two example meshes you can see Bandwidth testing over IPv4 and IPv6 on the right. This is a slightly smaller set of IPv6 sites because not all the sites in the UK are, are, uh, are dual stack, or the Perfsonos are dual stack yet. Um, and on the left hand side, you see the source, and on the, the top right, the tops, uh, you see the, the destination, um, and it's, it's a mess which, which, in which we can check the uh, IPERF 3 throughput. And you can see there's a cut of coding, so if the throughput is greater than 0.9 gigabits a second, um, it's green. 
and if it drops below a half a gigabit a second, it turns red. If you click on one of those squares, the website is down there, if you click on one of those squares, it takes you to a more detailed time series plot of the results. And this is example data that I picked pretty much at random uh, from the host at Durham to the host in Cambridge. Uh, and you can see they've got uh, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. This is over the last week. And this is the shows the variation in the throughput over IPv4, IPv6, uh, the packet loss, and also the latency. Sorry, there's a typo there. So uh, another bit of networking, network testing that we've been doing within GridPP is... Um, is, is to measure uh, what, what the file transfer throughput is achievable in practice. And in this uh, exercise, jobs sent via uh, a workload management system to each of the sites in Group PP that you see listed there, uh, and they copy files from all the other storage elements. And the time taken is measured, and then it's possible to a fit, a, a linear fit is made and we come up with, with some numbers indicating the, type, the, the throughput in megabytes a second. And these average, the average numbers uh, are displayed on the right-hand side. But we do this over IPv4 and IPv6 where it exists, and also uh, with, a, with a variety of different protocols which, which are in use within the WLCG, um, including HTTPS and uh, a, a protocol X, XR, XRoutD. Uh, and another thing that uh, the, the developer has implemented is, is to also, I asked him to record the volume of uh, data that's avail available over IPv6. And so this is where we come up with this, the number of 53%, uh, which I pointed out earlier, um, of, of, of the storage being accessible. And uh, in terms of the volume of the compute that is also available, it's slightly less, you can see it's about 30%, 31%. <laughs> so in summary, um, we in the WLCG would like to be ready for an offer of opportunistic IPv only, IPv6 only compute resources. We've been working and are slowly but surely making our computing service IPv6 enabled. Uh, we have worker nodes which are running in IPv6 only uh, in production at, a, at an Atlas site. Um, as tier, two, tier ones and the tier twos uh, are moving to make their, their storage production, production storage IPv6 accessible, and it's about 64 and 46 percent respectively. So now just under a half of the data is accessible. Uh, in terms of data volumes transferred, about 20 to 25 percent. Um, of bulk data transfers now go over IPv6. And about half of the Perfsonar network monitoring hosts are reporting that they are IPv6 enabled. So finally, I think one hopefully positive side effect or of all this is that we're encouraging <coughs> the adoption and the rollout of IPv6 in what I think is quite a large number of research institutes worldwide. Um, which hopefully is a good thing. So I'm humbly working the re reporting the work done by uh, a large number of people in the WLCG and specifically the HEPIX IPv6 Working Group and the WLCG IPv6 Task Force. Thank you. Showing how science is acting as a, uh, a driver for IPv6. What's this showing us, Duncan? Uh, a pretty picture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. It shows that all, all roads lead to Geneva. Oh, so, right. um, I think this are jobs going out to all the sites from, uh, from, from CERN. There's also other internal traffic that you, you, between sites probably that you don't see here. Okay. So are there any questions for Duncan? Uh, if not, I've got one question. So 
Um, in the UK, it's, or worldwide, it's something like 48% uh, of the storage is dual stack, but of the transfers, there's only 20 to 25% that are happening over V6. So that implies there's uh, not perhaps as much V6 as you might expect, or is that that the compute it's the funny, that are streaming the data? Are, are we not talked about this at lunch. If, if you think about it, you've got only a quarter of the total number of sites, only the IPv6 and IPv6 sites. Can, uh, can transfer their data over. So I guess the interesting question is where V6 is available and there's a dual stack client, do you know whether V6 is being used preferentially all the time or is there a way of measuring that? Well, one, another issue is that uh, even though you've got sites which are dual stack, you need the FTS servers to also have uh, dual, to be dual stack before the transfers themselves will go over. IPv6, and there's a couple of the large FTS servers which are not yet um, uh, dual stacked. So that's when, the, if that were to happen, the, the the percentage of data going over IPv6 I think would increase. Right. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, if not, thank you very much, then.